Our next presentation is from Perry Keller of UFSA, the Universal Flash Storage Association. The UFSA's learnings in preparing for UFS card logo certification test. Perry is uh, the team lead for Keysight's Technologies Digital Applications and Standards Program, and he manages its uh, memory applications program. He represents Keysight on JETIC and the Universal Storage Association Board of Directors. He's chairman of JETIC uh, committees 40.5 and JC64.5 logic and UFS validation committees, as well as uh, chairing the UFSA compliance committee. Perry joined Hewlett Packard in 1980 after graduating from Rice University with a master's degree in electrical engineering. At Agilent and now Keysight, Perry has served in project management architecture and R&D roles for hardware, software, and ASIC development, as well as marketing and product planning for high-performance instruments and applications. Please welcome Perry Keller of UFSA. Hit the button. There you go. So I get steadily smaller as the That's it. as That's it shrink, the time shrinks towards zero. <laughs> okay. Great. I'm going to take a risk and set my coke here, and hopefully it won't get decorated as we're going through. So, thanks, Roy, for the introduction. Uh, and again, I'm I'm Perry Keller. Um, I'm speaking here as the uh, Universal Flash Storage Association's uh, Compliance Chair and Director. The, one of the things that's, uh, I was really interested in how Joel ended his talk, because he's talking about receiver tests and some of, the, some of the issues that you run into with trying to standardize or, or expedite or automate receiver testing in a MIPI environment. And that, that's precisely one of the things that the UFSA has run into in its putting together a compliance program for UFS, because that's, that's something where you have to be able to get through a lot of tests, do it reliably uh, and accurately, and make it as, as automated as possible. So what I wanted to do here uh, today is just give you a flavor for, of what kinds of things uh, we've learned in putting together this compliance test program. The, the thing about UFS is, is it's really uh, different from anything else, uh, both technically uh, and from sort of an a, a infrastructure standpoint and a uh, industry relationship standpoint uh, for a long, that's existed for a long time. Of course, it's Compared to its predecessor, which is uh, EMMC, um, which is very similar to Memory Stick uh, and, and SD, which were basically uh, parallel interfaces, uh, relatively low speed. UFS uses MFI, and which is basically a uh, one, three, six gigabit microwave speed digital signaling environment, and and so that by itself creates a whole host of of additional uh, design considerations, system design, and, and certification and test issues. It also has a very high level of functionality. The protocol is, is basically taken from uh, T10's SCSI protocol. It implements the SCSI architecture uh, command set, and, and the idea behind that was that uh, not only were a lot of the uh, higher capability systems that, like desktops and, uh, and, the, uh, and laptops, uh, they actually talk SCSI uh, internally, even to an IDE drive. And, and so there's a lot of knowledge uh, about how to manage those, that kind of um, architectural set in order to get high performance. Um, so there's a lot of functional capability uh, and the, the, the protocol under uh, these, the implementations that align the protocol can be very very complex. But the thing that's, that, that was really distinctive uh, from 
the point of view of a, of a test person like myself is, is not the test complexity per se, but, but the, uh, the ecosystem, the existence of an ecosystem to support putting together a compliance program for something that's this new. The uh, UFS combines technologies from at least four different organizations, JEDEC, uh, T10, uh, and MIPI, um, and with Unipro, and with MFI. And if you look at other standards that have been developed over time, they've traditionally been pretty vertically integrated. Uh, PCI Express, USB, SATA, even SAS. Um, they're all pretty, there's one group that pretty much owns all the layers from the physical through the protocol. And th that's been changing at the industry level, but UFS is, is one of the first to, you know, to just sort of take the deep dive on this. The, uh, the other thing that's distinct about it is it's, it was intended from the start to support both embedded and, and I call them open systems, but basically in an embedded system, the, the bus, the interface itself, really isn't going to be visible to the end user. And in an open system, it is. Uh, and I'll get back to more of this later. That has some subtle and really important implications on uh, how you do uh, testing of this, especially certification or compliance, uh, even conformance testing, as, as uh, MIPI itself is doing. The, the thing that's really interesting, too, about this is if, if you look back, there really isn't any mass market, consumer accessible, uh, high, high technology interface introduced in the last 15 to 20 years. I mean, the, the, the last one to be introduced actually was uh, HDMI in 2000. And of course, you see HDMI logos on everything. And from the start, it had a very rigorous uh, certification program under, underlying the HDMI logo. Before that, the last one was USB. So this, this is a long time, 15 to 20 years, since anyone has really tried to do anything like what the UFSA has tried to do in create a, uh, a way of a technical underpinning for a strong logo program uh, that, that is there because end users, consumers, need to be able to have confidence that, that what they're buying will work. So making UFS a commercially successful technology um, really boils down to ecosystem enablement, making sure that there, there's a supply chain, that there's people who actually implement it both on the host and the device side, um, and that their products will, will interoperate, that there's a legal infrastructure that allows uh, things like a logo program to exist, and then there's a, a technical infrastructure and an organizational and, and, and process, process mechanism in place to support uh, things like a, a compliance certification program. Almost nobody was, I'm, I'm sure very few people in this room were even around when HDMI uh, or USB got off the ground. We all sort of take for granted that these things just exist and that they work and they're machines. That's not true. These, these are mature animals now, and a lot of the understanding that, that was learned back when they started uh, has been lost and has had to be recreated and re-engineered with, uh, with UFS. So we had to start with, with some basic requirements. You know, what were the goals uh, for this, for a compliance program? The, um, and, uh, and of course, the basic goal is to make sure that, that different devices and hosts will reliably interoperate. And, you know, I, I think if you're here, you probably realize that that's not always a given. Uh, of course, if it was, most of us probably wouldn't have jobs. Um, but there's ways that you can do that that will work, and there are ways that you won't in test that, that won't work in testing. And and one of the tricks is to try and get good test coverage without having to do exhaustive testing of every possible feature 
uh, that's described in this spec, which by the way, won't work anyway, because, because specs are always incomplete and they, they talk about specific functions. They don't always talk about the interactions and the indirect paths that, that, that a real product goes through, uh, which is where a lot of the failures can, can pop up. Another, another key goal too though is to take the, the real world experience that comes from testing uh, and examining uh, actual devices, uh, even doing static analysis, if you will, of the specification to say, well, here's what the test, uh, here, here's what the spec says, how would you actually test that? Um, provides valuable feedback. In software design, you know, static testing design reviews uh, are, are one of the more powerful techniques. Well, developing test procedures is, is an extremely powerful technique for doing static testing of specifications. And, and in this case, we're fortunate in that the MIPI Alliance and JEDEC uh, basically had the spec experts work on these test procedures. Um, but it, as I'll talk about uh, in a moment, just writing the procedures gives a lot of value, but, it, but you're not done when those procedures are written and, and published in a spec. So by, by providing this real world feedback, when you actually take a procedure and run it and test the test, um, that also provides valuable information and feedback uh, to, the, to the specification developers and the des designers and implementers. And this is something that we've seen in spades in bringing up the UFS uh, compliance process. In the end, the idea is that there's a logo, UFS logo, that the UFSA has established and owns, and, and the testing is there to ensure that that logo actually means something. The, uh, if in, in an embedded, if in, in other technologies, say, that, that are expected to be completely embedded and they're not visible, uh, to people who aren't knowledgeable uh, about the, the interface. You may go to a supplier and say, okay, I want to buy a part from you. I want to use it in my system. Uh, prove to me that it does what you say it will do. You know, and, and they, may hand you a, um, they may hand you a pile of paper this big you know, or a 100 megabyte PDF file or something with a bunch of test results in it that says, maybe at the beginning there's a summary that says pass, 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 pass. And then to prove that they didn't just say printf pass, you know, at the beginning of their test software, you know, they've got results inside that you can leave through. Well, when you're buying a, a, a product, say, at, at Walgreens, you know, and you're going to plug it into something that you bought down at the AT&T store, um, you're not going to have access to that information. And even if you did, it's not going to make any sense uh, to most people, even probably to most of us in this room. So. The logo itself is basically a surrogate for a thick test report that says, yes, this does do what it claims it's supposed to do. Now, another difference, uh, uh, said another requirement, and, and this is due to changes in the industry over, over many years, is that uh, the UFSA needed to use a, a more open process for doing this work. In the past, uh, take USB, for example, or PCI Express or, or HDMI. In each of those cases, there's, there's some company that has a strategic stake in making that technology work and getting it out into the market. Um, in HDMI's case, initially it was Panasonic. For HDMI 1.3, uh, Sony was keying the PlayStation 3's introduction to getting the HDMI 1.2 or 1.3 spec out the door. And, and so, you know, there's billions of dollars of business behind that. And, and so these big companies could put a lot of people on the job of making sure that each piece that's required is ready. And of course, Intel has long experience at this. Over the last 15 years or so, a lot of those companies have lost that expertise those people have been laid off or they've retired um, or, or management really sees 
their, their core contribution in, in, you know, in another place. Almost nobody sees technology enablement as part of you know, your core contribution. And so when UFS started, there was really nobody that could step up and fill that role, uh, which is frankly why um, uh, a test company like Keysight was asked to get involved because, because it, a test company's been in, sort of on the receiving end, if you will, of a lot of these, uh, a lot of these activities in the past. Um, and, is, and can be a reservoir, if you will, of, of the tribal knowledge that's required to put these things together. And so uh, within the context of being an open group, which anybody can join and anybody can contribute to, uh, we've had to lead the development of a lot of the processes and policies and, and actual physical documents, as well as the actual testing to be done that's needed to support the UFS compliance program. So how do we get this tribal knowledge back? That's a lot of what it boils down to. And that is, a good way to do that is just look around because there's, there are a lot of groups out there that, that manage uh, logo programs and do certification testing and have built long established machines uh, that can implement this. Uh, well, this is a new machine, so we have to build it from parts. And, and not being very proud, uh, the UFSA would take the best ideas that it could see uh, that were out there. In a sense, we, we had 20 years of experience to draw on to figure out what worked and what didn't work. What are the best practices? So one of the very first decisions that was made is that, that over the long term, uh, well, and even the short term, that the testing should really be done by independent third parties. There, there is a long tradition within the memory industry of doing self-certification. Um, in fact, the only memory-like thing that I can think of, and I've been involved in probably every memory technology uh, that there has been in the last uh, 20 years, is SATA where there actually is a certification process, you know, some, some physical testing that has to be done, and you gotta get it done. You know, and I'm not counting things like USB thumb drives, because that's not really, uh, the standard isn't necessarily for memory. DRAM, uh, EMMC, SD, memory stick, all these things, they're all self-certified. And at these speeds, and with this kind of functional complexity, it was felt that, and especially with the end user, you know, consumer uh, angle on this, it was really required to have independent third party uh, certification. And so in the end, that will mean that authorized, the test centers will be authorized to do this as they are right now uh, for USB 1.0 and 2.0. Uh, in the short term, as I'll describe, where we need to actually boot up the system, the UFSA is functioning as that third party. Um, but, but that's the way it is from the start. Um, the, other, the other key uh, decision was that we wanted to support multi-level multi certification. And what that means is that when you're making, let's say you're gonna make a phone or something that's got uh, UFS capability in it, embedded or a card or, or whatever. Well, that's a PC board with a connector and then it's got an SOC, an ASIC on it, and that SOC is built out of IP blocks that, that may have come from other companies, uh, many different companies. Certainly, uh, when, when you have the device, the UFS storage device, the IP, the silicon in there is distinct, the IP comes from a different place, and so there's a lot of layers that go that have to be assembled together to create a working UFS system. And so we wanted to engineer a, a way that, that certification could be done as the subsystems are developed so that the, the people who use those subsystems can get the same kind of risk reduction that the end users get uh, through the logo. And, and the basic idea behind that was that that should be a good enabling strategy 
to, to help with adoption. Because if you're buying, say, a piece of Unipro IP and from two folks, and one says, you know, I've been through the ringer here. I've, it's been tested, not by me, of course. I've done the testing, but here's somebody else who's done it, and they say, yes, it, it works. You know, and you compare that to someone else who, who, who can't say that, you know, what's your bias going to be? What's that going to tell you about the reliability of, of placing your product in the hands of that other piece of IP? Now, that's unusual in the embedded world. And so, not surprisingly, it, it really hasn't taken off yet as a use model. But the UFSA uh, felt it was important to be ready for that. And in fact, we haven't done any certifications at that level, but, but we're prepared to do it now uh, and, and at any time. In order to, to get this, uh, get the quality of the results is, and get the, uh, to, a, to a high level, the, uh, there were a few things that we wanted to do uh, that you have to do in order to, to get high coverage and high quality but, but not end up spending a fortune in money, equipment, uh, or test time. And so if you look at the, say, uh, the, the compliance, the conformance test specs for M5 and, and Unipro and uh, JESD 224B, which describes the UFS protocol, um, the, the, the JETIC spec is, is pretty well segmented uh, as far as test procedures, but within this, the, the uh, Unipro and m 5 CTS, there's an awful lot of tests and an awful lot of different test cases, and not all of them are orthogonal. In fact, most of them are not. Many of the modes that, say, m 5 supports that um, are not even needed in UFS. And so it makes no sense if you're testing a UFS-5 to, to test high-speed, unterminated modes because it's, it's just ruled out. So there's, if you look at all the different test cases that could be, that could be run, um, maybe only about 25% of them or so make sense to run. Uh, others will drill deep on information that comes from one test case. So you run another test and it adds information, but it really doesn't make a big difference uh, in terms of, is this thing going to work in the end user's hands? So the UFSA, one of the first things that, that uh, we did in the compliance committee is put together a test matrix that drew on all of the procedures that, that were developed by the experts in, in MIPI and JEDEC, and then said, these are the ones that we think are key, the ones that really uh, stand apart from the others as delivering new information that's really a really important predictor of interoperability. Uh, and then we, we asked the MIPI work groups to review that from a technical perspective uh, as well as JEDEC. And, and from that created what's called the CTM or Compliance Test Matrix. And you can actually go online in the UFSA website and you can download that. Now, that was really originally developed for UFS 1.0 and it's, we're in the process right now of updating it for UFS uh, 2.1. But you can see the idea there. And, and really, before that matrix was put together, there, there wasn't anything, at least that I could find, that just summarized all the tests and all the different test cases and all the combinations of environments, like high amplitude, low amplitude, gear one, tier two, tier three. You multiply all that out, and you get like 10,000 test cases. Um, that's clearly too many to run in a workshop or a plug fest. The other thing that we did was uh, mixed types of tests to get good coverage. And I'll describe this more in a moment. Monte Carlo for, to, to cover things that the spec doesn't cover or the explicitly or the test procedures don't cover, as well as regression tests, which is basically what the CTS documents described. And then finally, uh, we had to do this in a very quiet way, frankly. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of how long it's taken UFS uh, to gestate and then finally, finally come out. Well, in, in that amount of time, everyone 
and you all know how, how sensitive people are to schedules, right? So, I mean, that's very sensitive information. You can learn a lot at a workshop about where your competitors are uh, in product development. And for something that was brand new and potentially such a huge business, um, that was a big issue. And so we had to spend a lot of effort to make sure that, that uh, the participants in the process um, could do it confidentially and not even pass each other on the parking lot, you know, as one is leaving and the other is coming in. And eventually that, that will be relaxed, um, but, but even now it's, it's still an important requirement. So let me dig into the, the technologies, uh, the insides of this a bit more. So you've got three basic kinds of testing. There's devices, there's hosts, and then there's system testing. And, and, and so the, the system testing, uh, which is basically interoperability testing, that's where the Monte Carlo mechanisms come in. You, you, so we'll run applications like benchmarks, uh, mass storage benchmarks. And, and we don't care so much about what the number is, but we care whether it finished without crashing. Um, cause the, so those, those will do a good job of bringing out all the different functions that you could do with mass storage. Device test and host test are where the regression tests are run. So they're the things that actually tell you for sure, yeah, this is a UFS thingy. Because in, in principle, you could run a benchmark you know, on a USB drive connected to a tablet um, as an interop test. And it could complete just fine as long as the OS implements that properly. So it doesn't identify a UFS thingy, you know, by itself. But the regression tests certainly do. And the the focus in initially has been on device testing uh, because it's the easiest, and the device vendors were the guys really driving this. Host testing is technically much more difficult, and Jetic is now working on on defining what the infrastructure needs to be in the spec to properly support that. Um, and that is something, and a lot of that's driven by uh, the UFSA. Uh, the idea is if you're gonna have a host that's gonna accept a device, uh, you'd like to have some assurance that the host is actually going to uh, implement the standard properly so that the device will work. Uh, personally, I was always a little puzzled that the device guys weren't more interested in this. Because uh, as you know, when you get into um, you, when you get in a support phase, there's a lot of finger pointing that goes on, and host testing would do go a long way towards keeping the finger pointed in the right direction. So here's the compliance test matrix, and and so. Along the left, you see these, this, this is the, these are the set of test procedures that are described in either the MIPI CTSs or, or uh, JSD 224, which is JEDEX uh, UFS protocol uh, test spec. And, and then across here are the different test modes. So you've got things like large amplitude, small amplitude, terminated, unterminated, reference clock frequency, which speed, are you doing high speed, PWM, whatever. The, the trick here is that, well, you got a bunch of these, but these all are different dimensions, and the number of, say, gear speed that you have, and the number of reference clocks that you have to use, and what amplitude you used, that all multiplies together. So when you, when you think about how many test cases do you really have to run, it's, it's the product of everything, whoops, I'm sorry. It's the product, oh, I'm hitting the wrong button. Of this, the number of green things here with the number of green things in this section and the number in this section and so on. And that was the thing that we really needed to focus on, on how to turn things white, make it optional or, or informative or just not applicable without compromising the integrity of the test results. For interoperability testing, it's different. And, and in the case of embedded, there's really not, um, uh, the infrastructure isn't really there yet to, to do interop testing on, on embedded. But with the cards coming out, it becomes a lot easier. So if someone 
has a new host, there will be a set of golden cards, uh, golden devices that the host will have to work with. And if someone's coming out with a, with a new device, a new card, then there'll be a set of golden hosts that they have to interoperate with and work successfully. And so that's how we get the, the uh, coverage. The CTM was published because that seemed to be actually a real unmet need in the industry. Um, nothing like it seemed to exist before. And you know, I, I, I talked to many folks uh, who were saying that their customers were asking them for these thick test reports. And so, well, what do you want? I want, you, I want to see everything in the MIPI CTS pass. You know, and, and, and then I would look back and, I, and I'd say, that's ridiculous. You know, it's by, by definition. So, you know, either who's telling you that or who's asking it doesn't know what they're talking about because more than half of the functions in, in MFI don't even apply to UFS. So the, the final process that we came up for certification uh, looks like this. And so uh, the, the basic idea is we want to leave the actual test procedure development to the experts. Those are the people who wrote and understand the specs really well. So, so things like the CTS uh, and the, the JEDIC procedures, they're written in MIPI and in JEDIC. Um, and what the UFSA did was basically put together the CTM and then a bunch of other policies and procedures and, and uh, support infrastructure to enable those procedures to be, to be run in a convenient way uh, to, to be able to verify uh, logo certification requirements. So you've got these test procedures that come from JEDIC and MIPI and the, and the uh, UFSA Compliance Committee uh, basically maintains this, the, the, uh, the test specif the combined test spec, which again is, is pointers to specific things here, uh, along with the rules of the road for how you actually make that happen. So what will happen is, is if, a, uh, if a product wants to become certified, the main requirement is, well, there's several requirements, but the process is first, you gotta become a UFSA adopter member, um, which isn't that expensive. And, and then you need to get your product tested. And again, right now, this testing's done in workshops that are held by the UFSA, but over time, uh, probably over the next year, you're gonna to start to see uh, authorized test centers, you know, and there's many of them that are in that business uh, to, that, that will be certified by the UFSA to run these tests, and out of it would come a document, a certificate that says, yes, these tests have been run and, and uh, the product does what it's supposed to do. And then, the, um, uh, and then that goes in with a license application form to the UFSA and if everything uh, looks good, then bingo, you get a set of TIFF files and, and a legal document that says don't, do, don't say bad things about us, that kind of a thing. So the, at the top level, the process really isn't that complicated, um, and, it, and it shouldn't be. So I want to come back again to how things have changed since you know, UFS started, and this is where I'll focus on what's different between embedded and a card, because this is important from a organizational cultural perspective. Everything really that, that I'm aware of that MIPI has been working on in the past has really been focused on embedded use. CFI, DFI, uh, DigRF, um, the battery interface, all of these things are things that, are, that live inside a device. And, and it's the, the platform, the, the, the phone, the tablet, the computing, you know, the mobile terminal developers who are responsible for making sure that that thing works. They choose who their suppliers are. Um, they choose what software goes on it. They have control over many parts of the use model, the workload, and so on. And so, so they can do 
a lot of testing internally, which they would have to do anyway, to make sure that uh, things work. And let's say they have a problem with one supplier and they need to change suppliers. Well, they're, before that other supplier is qualified to, to replace, and most of them do have second sources, they're going to go through similar kind of testing as well. That's all done in private, you know, because you, you buy, well, for example, when you buy, if you buy an S7, uh, you don't blame the battery people if it burns, you blame Samsung, right? Um, and that's, that's why they have to do this kind of testing. But a card is different. And I think you all understand the use model. You go out, you, you, get a, you might get a phone, you know, when a phone or tablet that, that accepts a UFS card eventually comes out, uh, there's going to be a handful of cards available. Uh, there's already at least, I guess, two manufacturers who said, yeah, we're, you know, we're prepared to offer cards. Um, and you can bet that when that platform comes out, it's going to be tested with every different card that they can get their hands on. Um, and it'll go through the same kind of rigor that you'd normally do with embedded testing. But a year later, of course, you may say, well, hey, I like the phone, but I want to get more memory in here or something. And you're going to go down to the drugstore or the kiosk, and you get a new card and stick it in the phone, and you're going to expect it to work. And that's where a lot of the assumptions, frankly, that underlie many of the technical decisions that, uh, that you've been able to rely on uh, when you're doing embedded system specs start to unravel. Um, you can't count on the, in fact, it's almost a for sure that the testing that was done here with these cards, for example, has not been redone with these in time for someone to go out to the store and buy them. They just have to work. So as, as a practical matter, for instance, uh, you have to think about how will the whole system work together? Are the right kind of test functions embedded or supported in each of these specs that are supposed to be mix and match? Will each of the, each of the, the pieces, each of the technologies stand on their own or are they, if they're depending on other specifications, other parts of the system to be able to be tested in an end user environment, um, is that a reasonable assumption to make? And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a subtle but important uh, mindset shift when developing a, a specification and, and putting a, a testing program together. So this this has an impact on, on how we do the compliance testing. Again, you know, here we've got embedded. For embedded, it's really, uh, you want to make sure there's, uh, a, lot, a lot of the procedures in the CTS especially are clearly focused on characterization. They're guidance to the engineers to figure out how do I get to each of these functions and, and help me do bench and lab testing and characterization, um, not certification. So they're good for conformance, but they're, but, but they're really overkill for compliance. Um, when it's exposed, though, you've got to prove that what you've implemented really is sufficiently UFS that it will interoperate. And you have to make sure that you get higher coverage than what people will normally run in the lab uh, in an hour at a reasonable cost. And, and so this really affects how the specs should be written, not only the base specs, but also the, the compliance test spec. And, and so the UFSA has worked uh, closely with MIPI on the CTM. Um, and, and it was important to have the work groups review that to make sure that we didn't miss something that was important. And, and I don't have direct feedback on this, but, but it wouldn't surprise me if a lot of folks, they get the CTM, even for their internal use, they'll test the stuff first that's in there and then dig into the other stuff as, as uh, required. Now, this is a very busy slide. I'm not going to walk through the whole thing. Uh, the point here is, of course, you know, it's taken a long time to get UFS out. 
we went through several phases to get this work done. Uh, the first thing we had to do was test the tests. And this is where the first set of private workshops were held, by invitation only. Um, and even today, normal test results were only disclosed to, the, to each participant, and nobody knew who the other participants were. And that's still pretty much true to this day. Um, and that period went on for almost a year and a half, and we found things in the procedures that, that, were, that were a problem, either ambiguous, or in some cases, the, the test really just didn't do what, was, uh, what we felt was needed. And so feedback could be provided to, uh, to MIPI or JEDIC in that case. After that year or so period, we finally got to the point a few months ago where we could actually run the tests and get a logo certification. And now we're starting to focus on ATCs uh, to test the testers. Uh, we're not so worried about testing the tests. There's a lot of stuff that's going back to JEDIC um, on the protocol side uh, to get cleared up, and a lot of changes, updates to the CTM for UFS 2.1 because of what was learned. So basically, my, the, 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 the key walkaways here is uh, that I'd like you to under, uh, pick up from this is that compliance and certification are, compliance and conformance are two very different things. Something that is conformant may not necessarily be compliant. Something that's compliant isn't necessarily conformant. That's because they have two different kinds of purposes. Um, the, the, there is overlap between the two. Um, and the precision required in bench characterization versus compliance test is sometimes different. So, you don't need to calibrate the BERT you know, to the, the nth degree in order to be able to run the tests that have been selected. Uh, the other thing is test the tests. When the CTS is published, it's not done. Um, one thing I, I'm certain of is that before the UFSA started running these, nobody, nobody had run all of those procedures systematically as they were written. We just found too much stuff in there. And then finally, how you factor where the test support goes is different depending on whether you're going to have a fully embedded environment or a more open environment where things are more mix and match. So I'm, uh, I'm supposed to shrink to nothing here. Um, so I'll draw it to a close. But if, if there's a couple of questions, I suppose I can uh, impose on, on Gordon. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Let me just bring the mic over oh. so everyone can hear this. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, actually, I have two questions. Yeah. So in your slide, uh, you show the M5 uh, test metrics for UFS application. So is that document is that public? I can download from somewhere. You have to be a MIPI member to get access to that document. Okay, so uh, I think I, I'm the movie member. The second question is, uh, is any JTAG recommended like uh, benchmarking software we can use? Any? Uh, like benchmarking, right? So uh, when you're doing the system in the op, right? So uh, like throughput performance, that oh, kind of. Right now, no. The, the, you, there, may, there may begin to be some, some speed grade stuff uh, that, that's developed in the UFSA, but right now it, it doesn't exist. The big problem is it's a 12-dimensional space, and, but, but that's, that's not something end users can digest easily. You know, there's, there's at least five different logo modifiers on SD that describe speed, okay. and you know, none of them have been perfect. Okay, is that in the plan or something in the future? Yes, yes, okay. I would expect that, but it's not, it's not top on the list. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Anything else? Right here. Yeah, uh, like you said, uh, there's uh, three, at least, uh, different committee, right, for the UFS, uh, the MIPI and the JTAC and, of course, UFSA. So when we try to get the logo, uh, who the committee we're going to ask for, UFSA or O3? UFSA. Neither JETIC nor MIPI do compliance certification or support a logo program. 
And that, frankly, was, I think, a wise decision on the part of the MIPI board, um, because there's an awful lot that goes into it that makes it different from conformance, uh, which is conformance is very useful for implementers, um, but it's not enough for to support a logo program. So you would come to the UFSA. It's the only group that looks at the whole system, make sure it all plays together. Yeah. So uh, if we have something to uh, want to get the logo or testing, so do you see uh, any near future? You're going to have a workshop or plaque fest like that? The next one's being scheduled right now, driven mostly, frankly, by when people will need it to happen. Eventually, they'll occur on a regular schedule. But again, at this startup phase, it's, uh, it, we're, it's being more, it's more flexible. You know, when there's 100 different people doing it, we'll have to have a regular schedule. Oh, if I have a special uh, requirement, uh, we can contact you or the committee for... Sure, you can contact me or go to the UFSA website. Right. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, Perry, thank you Thanks, very much. Thanks, Roy. I owe Gordon a beer.